Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker. We do begin with breaking news on the world stage. Just moments ago, President Biden delivering remarks from Saudi Arabia after his controversial meeting with the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, the alleged mastermind behind the murder of journalist and Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi. He told reporters he raised the killing of Khashoggi with the Saudi Crown Prince and also told him he believes he was responsible. The president saying he was straightforward and direct with MBS. He then took a few questions from reporters. We're going to get to all of it in just a moment. President Biden was reluctant to make this visit, perhaps out of concern of images like this one, this fist bumping with MBS when he arrived after vowing to make Saudi Arabia a pariah state. Washington Post publisher Fred Ryan called it, quote, worse than a handshake and, quote, shameful. But the White House finds itself in a bind due to Saudi's key role in global energy markets as inflation soars. When President Biden and the Saudi delegation appeared on camera earlier today, reporters in the room could not hear the remarks made by either the president or the crown prince due to restrictions placed by the palace. My NBC News colleague Peter Alexander still tried his best to ask MBS about Jamal Khashoggi. Take a listen. Jamal Khashoggi, will you apologize to his family, sir? Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you. President Biden is Saudi Arabia still you guys. According to new reporting from NBC News, today's meetings were a culmination of months of lobbying and persuading by officials in the administration to get the president on board. One official describing it to NBC News as a quote. Herculean effort. This final leg of the president's trip abroad closes out an already rough week that included bad poll numbers, a worse than expected inflation report, and now another setback to his domestic agenda on Capitol Hill. There was some hope President Biden would at least be able to secure some kind of a deal on oil production and prices before returning to D.C. But when he spoke with reporters, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan tamped down any expectations of an announcement with Saudi Arabia on that issue, though the president did just tease that there has been some progress. So with that, I'm joined now by my colleague, Kara Lee, who is in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, covering the president's trip. Dennis Ross, former special assistant and senior director for the central region in the Obama administration. And in just a moment, I'll be joined by David Ignatius, foreign policy columnist at The Washington Post. Thanks to all of you for being here. Carol, let's break down these headlines and what we just heard from President Biden. He said he did raise the issue of Jamal Khashoggi when he was meeting with the Saudi crown prince. He also seemed to tease that there may be some announcement on the matter of oil. Peter Alexander pressing him, when will that actually impact the price of gas here at home? The president saying it could be a couple of weeks. What were your key takeaways, Carol? Well, what you just mentioned, Kristen, the president saying that at the very top of this meeting with the crown prince, he raised the issue of Jamal Khashoggi's murder. He said going into this, he was asked if he would do that. He didn't commit to doing that. So it was a big question of how that would play out. He And he gave us a little bit of the blow by blow. I'll go through it with you for a second here. He said he, that he called the killing outrageous. He said he told the crown prince what he thought of the murder then and thinks of it now. And he said the crown prince responded by saying he's not responsible for it. And that, obviously, Kristen, is at odds with the intelligence, U.S. intelligence officials' assessment that the crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, directed that murder of Jamal Khashoggi. And so the president said that he responded to the crown prince by saying that he indicated he thought he was responsible for that murder. And the crown prince said he took actions against those who were responsible for it. So the president then saying that he was asked by our own Peter Alexander what, how he responded to Jamal Khashoggi's fiance, who said that the president has the blood of the crown prince's next victim on his hands. And he said, I'm sorry she feels that way. So he's not really standing down. And as far as just to answer your question on the oil issue, Kristen, what the president got is a commitment from Saudi Arabia to increase oil production by some 50 percent in the coming months. And so that's not insignificant. And for him to say that this is something that could have an impact in a matter of weeks is also significant because the White House was signaling going into this that whatever they would get, they were really downplaying it, saying it could take months, Kristen. Ambassador Ross, I want to get you to weigh in on all of this. Let's play a little bit of the sound that we just heard from President Biden. 
I raised it at the top of the meeting, making it clear what I thought of it at the time and what I think of it now. And it was exactly, I was straightforward and direct in discussing it. I made my view crystal clear. I said very straightforwardly, for an American president to be silent on an issue of human rights is this consistent with, inconsistent with who we are and who I am. I'll always stand up for our values. Ambassador Ross, do you believe that the president was firm enough, at least for his critics, who were very skeptical and downplayed and didn't think that he should have this meeting in the first place? Well, the short answer to your question is the critics didn't want the meeting at all. They didn't want the visit at all. So there's really nothing he could have done that will satisfy the critics. What he did, however, is satisfy what I think are American interests, and he didn't sacrifice our values in the process. I say that because by raising Khashoggi, and no doubt by making it clear that there have to be boundaries within the relationship, and we will raise human rights issues and challenges when uh, the Saudis take steps that cross the line, he was making a point, and I suspect also, as I said, creating boundaries in the relationship. He went because we have a need. And it isn't just the immediate need of oil. It's also how do we manage the transition away from fossil fuels over the next 20 to 25 years if we don't have a stable oil market between now and then? We need the Saudis on board for that. We need the Saudis as well as part of a broader coalition as we compete with the Russians and the Chinese. That takes us not only to our interests, but it also involves our values because we're trying to create it a rules-based international order, and it's clear that both the Russians and the Chinese reject the kind of rules that we would like to see describe the international reality. David Ignatius has joined us now. David, what is your take? And let's start with that piece of it, the president's language that he says he used in that meeting to press the Saudi crown prince on the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. I think the fact that he was uh, forthright in saying to journalists, I raised it at the beginning of the meeting, I raised it firmly, he then said, I, th I, th I think it was outrageous then, I still think it was outrageous, I think th that was important. I would have liked to hear some more detail about why the president is confident, if he is, that something like this won't happen again. Saudi Arabia has many human rights issues that are of concern to Saudis, not just to us. Uh, and I, I'd like for the president to, to be clearer with the American people about what he's trying to achieve and what he's accomplished. Something that hasn't been mentioned that I think should be, the president talked about uh, continued diplomatic efforts to end the war in Yemen. The Yemen war has been a nightmare. This was something that MBS uh, launched. It was a reckless, unwise decision. The U.S. has been working closely with Saudi Arabia to try to end the war and the horrible suffering that's, that's been part of that war. So I was glad that the president talked about that. The president also talked about the ways in which Saudi Arabia is gradually moving towards some kind of normalization with Israel, starting with uh, the, the allowing air flights uh, over Sa Saudi territory. As the president said, that is a big deal. I can remember, as Dennis Ross can, a time when even to imagine that Saudi Arabia and, and Israel having that kind of contact would have been impossible. So there are things that, that disappointed me. I am frankly surprised that there wasn't more specific uh, uh, language agreement about, about energy. That's, that's the heart of the president's uh, mm. set of interests that he's, he's come out here to, to deal with. Uh, uh, maybe there's more coming. You always want to be careful. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll learn more. But there wasn't much in that. That initial press conference. I am glad that the president of the United States said before everybody in Saudi Arabia, the murder of my colleague, Jamal Khashoggi, was outrageous. I'm glad he said that. And I want to delve into that point you make about his language around the energy issue. Let me just get you to weigh in, though, on what we heard from The Washington Post. Uh, publisher and CEO Fred Ryan, he wrote, as I said at the top, the fist bump between President Biden and Mohammed bin Salman was worse than a handshake. It was shameful. It projected a level of intimacy and comfort that delivers to MBS the unwarranted redemption he has been desperately seeking. David, is that what that image does? Well, I need to let my publisher speak for, for himself and for our newspaper. I, I, I thought the fist bump, you know, compared to a handshake, is less uh, intimate, uh, less of an embrace. Mm. 
Um, certainly wasn't a kiss on both cheeks. Uh, I, I think the fact the president did, after the meeting, say in a pretty straightforward way what he told MBS about the killing of Jamal uh, is something that uh, I, I, I think I'm, I'm glad he said it. Um, should he have gone to Saudi Arabia at all? That's a question we've been debating. As I've written, this was a classic instance of rail politik. This is putting interests ahead of anything else. That's what the president did. We'll be arguing about it through the rest of his presidency. But the, 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 the fist bump per se, I, I don't think was a high volume, uh, you know, smooch, smooch on the cheek. No. Mm. Ambassador Ross, let me have you weigh in on a point that David was just making, which is that he wanted to hear more about the specifics, what was discussed as it relates to energy and Saudi Arabia releasing more oil. Did you hear any specifics in that? I do believe at the end he was pressed by my colleague Peter Alexander on when Americans might actually feel the impact of that. And the president said it would be a couple of weeks. I was surprised he put a timeline on it. What was your takeaway from that exchange? Well, my takeaway is quite similar to yours and actually to David's. I, my guess is that, in fact, there are some private understandings that we have with them right now that the, the Saudis probably want some time to go by so it doesn't look like they had to pay for the visit uh, with uh, a political decision on oil because the Saudis historically have always said they don't want to politicize the oil supply. They don't want to put themselves in a position where it becomes a kind of political football. They always define themselves as having the responsibility to try to manage stability within the oil market. So I suspect there are some private understandings. I do think there will be an increase in Saudi oil production I think that helps in terms of the oil market futures psychologically. We have to bear in mind a major part of the problem as it relates to gasoline is refinery capacity, and there isn't a whole lot of spare refinery capacity. So oil prices will go down mm -hmm. now just because demand is dropping, but there, the, the, the tight refinery situation limits how much we're going to see a drop in gasoline prices. Carol Lee, you have been reporting on whether this meeting would happen at all for months now. And you have some new reporting about just how difficult it was to actually make this happen. What are your sources telling you? Well, they're saying that this was something the president was very reluctant to do for all of the obvious reasons that we've been discussing, and that he took a lot of convincing. He, as out there on a limb, having said he'll make Saudi Arabia a pariah state as a candidate, there were many Democrats, people in his own administration, who were trying to hold his feet to the fire on that. And then there were people who were saying, hey, this isn't practical. There are a lot, there's a lot at stake here. We want, we think you need to make this visit and just and repair relations. And so when you hear hear the president talk about this, and we've heard him talk about this since he got to Israel. We now heard him here in Saudi Arabia. We heard him in the run-up to this trip. He tries to frame it as not just about the U.S. and Saudi Arabia, that it's out about something bigger. You heard him say he's going to be meeting with members of the Gulf Cooperation Council, other Arab states, and that this is about a bigger thing than just these two countries. And so, and essentially what he's trying to do, Kristen, is say that, hey, I got all of these things that he ticked off. Off, commitments on Yemen, commitments on oil, the airspace opening up, and other things, 5G and 6G to counter China. And he's saying this was worth it to all of his critics, and he's trying to make that case. We'll see if it, it holds water with the people who've criticized the president for doing this. But he didn't really want to do this. He's been very back and forth about it. He has said, even recently, he's not meeting with just MBS. He's meeting with other leaders that are there. And so there's this attempt to try to put distance to, to this between him and this trip and also try to justify it at the same time. And that's what we see from the president tonight. And we're going to continue to see that because these criticisms of his decision to make this visit are not going to go away. And Carol, I'm so glad that you end on that point, because I think it's such an important one. And David Ignatius, please weigh in. I mean, to some extent, this trip is an example of the challenges that American presidents have had in terms of dealing with Saudi Arabia throughout history. Because on the one hand, the global economy is dependent in part on Saudi oil and energy. And on the other hand, there are deep concerns about human rights abuses that have been there for decades. And in this instance, the president saying, look, 
there are broader goals that I need to try to address, one of them being that the president has said he doesn't want there to be a leadership vacuum in the Middle East for China, for Russia to be able to insert themselves in a more robust way. Talk a little bit about how that has factored into this trip. So I, I think ever since uh, the chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan, there's been a perception in the Gulf countries, in Saudi Arabia in particular, that the United States is essentially exiting the region as a key power. And I think Biden, as he said, uh, made this trip in significant part because he wants to say, no, that's not true. We're making a strategic recommitment uh, to the region. We're uh, recalibrating, not, not rupturing. Uh, we're here to, to steady uh, our, our longtime partners and allies. One useful way to think about this is to ask yourself what they're saying in Tehran tonight as they review this trip. And I would think, as, as the Iranians think about not simply the meeting today with MBS, but tomorrow's meetings with a range of Arab leaders, all of whom are aligned against Iran and implicitly al aligned with Israel, the Iranians would be, would be concerned that the United States is, to some extent, we'll see the details, shoring up that, uh, that effort to contain a still revolutionary destabilizing force in Iran. So I, I think, um, in my view, the president deserves credit for trying to come in and fill the vacuum. Uh, I'm glad he stated directly uh, the, his, his views about Jamal Khashoggi's murder. I'm, I'm, I'm glad he said that to, to, to the, in Saudi Arabia to the world. Uh, there are still a lot of details to be filled in. Saudi Arabia is not an easy ally to have, as, as Dennis Ross and your other guests know very well. But I, I think, you know, the, the build out from this is likely to involve uh, the kinds of details that we've known ever since this relationship began during World War II with President Roosevelt. Mm. Ambassador Ross, how are they viewing this meeting in Tehran tonight? What do you think the perception is? from that think, part of the world. I think the perception that David outlined is exactly right. What they see at a time when they're trying to use a Shiite militias as a, as a kind of cutting edge, as a tip of the spear, to build their influence and to create greater dominance in the region, what they're seeing is they're a coalition that has emerged against them. And what they're seeing is that their objective of forcing the U.S. out of the region is actually failing. The U.S. is actually going to be in the region. The more the president talks about the security architecture of regional security defense, the more he, in fact, sends the message that we will be integrated into this. We're not leaving the region, but we are going to share the burden so that we are able to more easily sustain that presence. I want to add one other point just on the whole interest issue of interests and values. Every president confronts this choice. How do you balance our interests? How do you balance our values? If you look back historically, no presidency more than Jimmy Carter has put human rights at the center of foreign policy. And yet, if you look at Jimmy Carter's policy vis-a-vis -vis the Saudis, you'll see that he put the, the preoccupation on interests and oil. So what you're seeing with President Biden is not just an interest on oil. It is related to Iran. It is related to preserving a regional order. And it's also related to the larger geopolitical reality that we're in a long-term competition with the Russians and the Chinese. We need a coalition not just of democracies, but of states that may not be democracies, but are also not revisionist states, not states that are trying to revise the regional order or the international order. And the Saudis fit in that context. The president has gone because it does meet our interests. Ultimately, it can also serve our values. Well, this was uh, such a robust conversation and breakdown of some very complicated headlines that we just got from President Biden. I really appreciate you all joining us this afternoon. Carol, Ambassador Ross and David Ignatius, thank you so very much. And coming up, Senator Manchin delivers another blow to the White House's agenda, his red lines and how lawmakers are reacting. That's next. Plus, new reporting that the Secret Service erased key text messages from around the time of the January 6th attack. Details on that story ahead. You're watching Meet the Press now. didn't make President Biden's week difficult enough, it now looks like much of his remaining domestic agenda is all but dead. 
Senator Joe Manchin now says he won't support an economic package that includes new climate spending or tax hikes on the wealthy, largely due to concerns that new spending would only make the inflation crisis worse. Manchin told a West Virginia radio station this morning Wednesday's red hot inflation report was exhibit A when he informed Majority Leader Chuck Schumer about his position. Take a listen. I said, Chuck, it's wrong. It's not prudent to do the other right now. I can't tell you in good faith because I can tell you one thing. I called your staff and they all knew exactly where I stood when we saw 9.1 percent. That was an alarming figure to me, higher than anything since from 40 plus years. So I said, oh, my goodness, let's wait now. I said, guys, this is a whole new this is a whole new page. For more, I'm joined now by Ali Vitale, who covers Capitol Hill for NBC News. And also with me is John Brezhnehan, co-founder of Punchbowl News, who's covered Congress for years. Thanks to both of you for being with me to discuss this not unexpected, but still a bombshell, I think, Ali. Look, Manchin voiced concern for any additional spending when the CPI report came out on Wednesday. We were talking about it. Yeah. So I guess the question is, what is the reaction? No one's surprised, but I imagine... Democrats are pretty frustrated. Yeah, look, if it wasn't this CPI report, then it was back in December when all of us were outside of his office and he was still talking to me and other reporters like Brez about the fact that he was concerned about inflation. He needed to make sure that everything that Democrats were talking about both then and now were paid for. And Manchin is really just kind of landing in the exact same place that many people thought that he would here. What I've heard from Democrats, though, and I've been spending today on the House side, of course, because the Senate is out, but what I've heard from Democrats largely is that they are, if not surprised, but still very frustrated. Some of them really questioning what they mm -hmm. did with their strategy to leverage the fact that they had the majority, they came in with extremely lofty goals for Build Back Better, and now where they're landing is effectively renegotiating or making reforms to the prescription drug pricing and then shoring up some pricing on the Affordable Care Act. Those are important things, but when you started with an initial offer of Bernie Sanders wanting $6 trillion and then Democrats coming down to $2.5 trillion, it's hard to look at those two pieces of policy without climate change, without increased taxes on the wealthy and corporations, and for Democrats to feel like it was all worth it. Mm. John, you know, they were so close, it seemed like, on some of those issues that Ali's talking about, prescription drugs, which is something that we know there's bipartisan support for. And yet the inflation numbers this week were significant, uh, exceeded expectations, frankly. So what is the reaction that you're hearing? Are there some Democrats who are relieved who say, look, these numbers are so high that maybe we do need to pause? You know, there's there's a mixed reaction, like Ali's saying. There's a real a, a lot of members are upset at Mansion. A lot of members are upset at their leadership. I mean, that Schumer and Mansion had started down this road again, and they were failed again very publicly. That is, uh, members are frustrated by that. I do think the Wednesday's inflation number shocked a lot of people. It came in higher than than anticipated. There had been some thought, you know. Previously, the, the the White House thought it would be lower. The Hill Democrats on the Hill thought it would be lower. They they'd seen gas prices slide, so I think there was shock to that. Um, you know, as Ali said, Manchin was yelling at us this week. He yelled at a bunch of reporters this week. You know, the whole thing is inflation, inflation, inflation. And I do think there, you know, I do think there are a number of Democrats at this point on July fifteenth, with the election less than four months away. If we could pass Medicare prescription drugs, if we could do something on Obamacare premium subsidies, let's just take it and run with it, declare a victory and go. And mm -hmm. I think there's a I think there's a pretty significant number of members who'll say that, you know, they'll get their, you know, they'll they'll take out their uh, venting on uh, mansion, but it, having something is better than having num nothing. And I think there's a number of them, especially in the Senate Democratic Caucus, will take anything at this point. Just about, you know, they, we, they've been going through yeah. this build back better since, you know, April of 2021. It's, you know, it's a long time. I think you're absolutely right about that. It's such a good point. And just to put a fine point on it, Ali Manchin told a West Virginia radio station this morning, look, he's still open to negotiating on reducing drug prices, that it's a timing thing. Take a listen to what he said. And also, so I said, Chuck, if you're on a political deadline, 
and it has to be done in July, the one thing you know you can get done is basically do the bill, run the piece of legislation on reducing drug prices, letting Medicare negotiate. That saves about $288 billion over 10 years. Take $40 billion of that and extend the Affordable Care Act, the, the, the discounts that people are getting, so their premiums won't go up. And also take the other $240 billion and put it to debt reduction. You're serious about inflation. You're reducing debt. So this is basically the point that you just heard John make, Ali. But do you think this is going to happen? I mean, is this where the Democratic agenda is heading now to get those small things done? Yeah, that seems very likely here. And look, those are still popular pieces of this, especially when you talk about shoring up that Obamacare pricing there. That's something that price hikes could hit in August. Certainly, you don't want to be the party heading into the midterm elections already with history sort of dogging you in that period and going in with people paying more for their health care because you didn't act soon enough to fix that. So certainly, that's something that Democrats will still be, if not excited to do, then at least they'll be willing to do as they head into the midterm term calendar. And look, the White House, President Biden even saying that they are pretty much good with where this is at, but Biden also adding that if Congress is unwilling or unable, or in this case maybe both, to act on climate change provisions, then he is looking into executive actions where he can do that himself. So that may not be the last that we've heard of it either. Yeah, it absolutely might not be. And John, of course, I go back to that op-ed by Senator Warren several months ago, where she basically said, Democrats have to get something done or else we're going to lose big time in the midterms. And the Washington Post, Jeff Stein, makes a really good point about how much of President Biden's domestic agenda has not gotten done. Let me just show you and show our viewers universal pre-K, child care, public housing, paid family leave, dental, vision care for seniors, free community college, child tax credit, and as Ali was just discussing climate plans. How devastating might this be in November? Yeah, I mean, in defense of the White House, they did get a lot of things done. They did a $1.9 trillion American rescue plan. He passed a gun bill. You know, it's not what they wanted, but it was the biggest gun bill in decades. If they pass prescription drugs, that's a big deal. I mean, I think that they, I do think that they have some successes. Um, the problem is, if we all noted, is inflation and economic fears are dominating everything. Mm -hmm. You know, gas prices are the barometer of American politics, okay? They're the thermometer. The higher the gas prices, the worse off any president is going to do. And, you know, that's where he's failed big time. I do think on the climate change issue, the problem here is that they've talked so long about it. And it, from an executive action standpoint, what the president can actually do is pretty limited, especially when you have the Supreme Court saying a couple of weeks ago that EPA can't regulate greenhouse gases, okay? So I do think there's going to be enormous frustration there. And there is with Manchin. You saw, I, we saw uh, Senator Heinrich from New Mexico. He's actually questioning whether Manchin should be the Energy and National Resources Chair anymore. So I do think there's, you know, they, they, they've gotten some things done. It's nowhere near what they wanted, but they also set themselves up for this. It was a 50-50 Senate. They had a five-seat margin in the House, and they were talking about, you know, as you noted, $4 trillion package. I just think it didn't—I right. I don't think they set themselves up on a path to success a year and a half ago, and I think that's, you know, and this is— and doing yeah. this all again in July just doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense to me, actually. It, it is a smart point. It is deja vu all over again, isn't it? Ali and John, great conversation on all of the developments from the Hill. Thank you so much. Coming up next, a Homeland Security watchdog accuses the Secret Service of deleting records from on and before January 6th. The agency says it was an honest mistake, not a cover-up. The disagreement and what it could mean for the January 6th committee's investigation. That's next. You're watching Meet the Press Now. We're back after a quick break. Welcome back. The Department of Homeland Security's Inspector General briefed the January 6th committee today after a letter to the committee from the watchdog revealed the Secret Service erased text messages sent before and during the January 6th insurrection. The DHS Inspector General asked for the electronic communications tied to those days as part of an investigation into the aftermath of the insurrection. The Secret Service maintains that the texts were not deleted intentionally, but were lost because of a pre-planned device 
device replacement program. The inspector general's letters say the texts were lost after they were requested, but the Secret Service says the data move was already underway before they were part of the investigation. So joining me to discuss this and break it all down, NBC News Justice correspondent Pete Williams. Pete, so great to see you. So what do we know about these deleted text messages? And also, what can you tell us about the content of the messages that they might be looking for? Well, the Secret Service says don't expect to find anything there. Uh, there is common ground between the IG and the Secret Service. They both agree that because of a long planned program to upgrade Secret Service phones, some text messages were deleted as they upgraded the phones because the material wasn't backed up. And on that, they both agree. Where the difference is this, the IG says that the Secret Service deleted some of this material after the IG asked for the information. The Secret Service says, no, no, we started the migration program in January. The IG didn't begin asking for material until February 26th of the year of the Capitol riot. So they disagree on which came first. But the Secret Service says a little more than this. It says, number one, we've been very cooperative. We've turned over almost 800,000 documents to the IG in response to requests from, from the IG. Secondly, they say, Secret Service policy forbids agents to communicate by text. So they say, uh, don't expect to find much there. And I've talked to some agents today who say basically, yeah, we don't communicate by texts. So the Secret Service's point here is, uh, they're not going to find much anyway. Uh, but the problem, of course, is without, without this material wiped away, there's now no way to absolutely conclusively prove that. So the question now is, can some of this material be reconstituted? Can they find it somehow? Can they recover it? And the committee says that's what they want to know. And I guess, what is the level of expectation that they'll be recovered? And who has the authority to do that, Pete? Well, the committees can ask the Secret Service to do that. Uh, and, of course, remember the IG's letter was to the, to the oversight committees that uh, have a supervision over Homeland Security, of which Secret Service is a part. That's the House and Senate Secret, uh, Homeland Security committees. But the January 6th committee is also interested and met with the IG today. So the, they'll, they'll try to get the Secret Service to see if it's, with its own, within its own backup systems, they can recover this. Secret Service text messages don't go into the cloud. Secret Service doesn't use the cloud for security reasons. And one of the reasons they tell agents not to text is they are worried they would be concerned about the ability to intercept those texts. All right, Pete Williams with such great information as always. Pete, great to see you, thank you. You too. And we do have an important update before we go to the break. The National Suicide Prevention Hotline launches with a new number starting tomorrow. Beginning Saturday, tomorrow, the number changes to the three simple digits on your screen, 988. Again, that's 988. Anyone experiencing a mental health crisis anywhere in the country can call or text 988 for emotional support. It is free, it is confidential, and it is available 24-7. It will help get you connected to a mental health professional to get you the resources you need. And folks, you are not alone. Help is just one text or phone call away. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Control of the Senate will come down to a few key states this November. Democrats are hoping to pick up a crucial seat in Wisconsin that's been long held by incumbent Senator Ron Johnson. Johnson finds himself vulnerable heading into the midterms with an approval rating that's been consistently under 40 percent since at least 2020, according to Marquette University polling. Now, Wisconsin Democrats have to decide which primary candidate is their best bet to run against him. NBC News correspondent Shaq Brewster has been on the ground interviewing candidates and voters in Wisconsin ahead of their first primary debate this Sunday. In the battle for control of the United States Senate, Wisconsin is a priority. It's all about uh, taking that seat back. Democratic voters here, less than a month away from electing their candidate to take on Republican incumbent Ron Johnson in November. This is so heavily weighted that I have to make a really good decision because we have to have someone who can really beat him. Ahead of their first debate, we watched as the contenders made their pitch across the state. From a picnic in Beaver Dam to a farming technology fair in a town of less than 1,300 people. I'm running for U.S. Senate. As the polling shows a tightening race, about one in three voters say they are still undecided. When voters come up to you just randomly, what's the one thing that you hear the most these days? 
I mean, like so much of it is just consternation with Ron Johnson, to be honest with you. And they want somebody that can win. Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes, the early favorite, a 35-year-old Milwaukee native with high name recognition, carrying the support of popular Democrats like Elizabeth Warren, Cory Booker, and AOC. I think having those national voices lends a, a lot of credibility to the work that we're looking to get done uh, across this country. Well, I'm a working class candidate. I'm a working class individual. Uh, the people in the U.S. Senate don't understand what life is like for working people. His pitch, an attack on the incumbent, but also an unmistakable jab at his closest Democratic rivals, especially Alex Lazary. Gets it done. Whose support jumped as he turned millions of his own dollars into a flood of television ads. Yeah. I'm the Bucks guy. The 35-year-old Milwaukee Bucks executive now statistically tied for first place. It's not just about the money being spent on television. I know that's, you know, what the the shiny object and what the pundits love to talk about. I've got that track record, whether it's raising wages, you know, helping create 10,000 good-paying union jobs or bringing more investment to this state. But with abortion now heavily restricted in Wisconsin, State Treasurer Sarah Godlewski says her campaign has new momentum. As the only woman in this race, uh, the whole overturning Roe v. Wade has really been, I believe, a game changer because right now women in the state of Wisconsin no longer have the ability to make their reproductive freedom decisions. They have to either go to Minnesota or to Illinois, and that's just wrong. There's little daylight between these candidates, all back a federal law guaranteeing the right to an abortion, and each support an end to the filibuster to pass their full agenda. The number one issue in this race is who could beat Ron Johnson. I'm the only one from a red part of the state who's won election and re-election six times. But for that to happen, they say Democrats need to diminish their losses here in November, winning back voters in places like Clark County, where there's been a more than 40-point swing toward Republicans since 2008. It's showing up. It's showing up. It's about showing up. The chair of the state party's rural caucus saying the candidates have more work to do. There's a code, there's a language that rural people, like many cu cultural aspects of the country, that you have to adhere to. And uh, Democrats have lost that skill. Both a challenge and an opportunity for them. I guess it doesn't matter what they say because I don't know that they would that they mean it. As Democrats see a vulnerable Republican who they've been unable to beat. Shaq Brewster joins me now from Milwaukee. What a fantastic report, Shaq. Go ahead, Shaq. Thank you, Kristen. And I just wanted to note that we reached out to the Johnson campaign, asking them about the attention that they've been receiving from those Democratic candidates. We have the statement that the campaign did hand us about an hour or so ago. I want to put it up on screen there. They say Ron Johnson is focused on fighting for Wisconsin and repairing the damage done by the Biden administration's disastrous policies that have led to record inflation, sky high gas prices, open borders, and runaway spending. Kristen, that's a sign of the focus that you're going to hear from the Republicans. Republicans in this race. But meanwhile, here in Milwaukee, the rally between Cory Booker and Mandela Barnes just wrapped up. You see the folks waiting behind me for that selfie line that we saw and became popular in the 2020 presidential race. One thing that we heard on stage is, yes, a focus on Ron Johnson, but you really got a sense that these candidates are trying to nationalize this race as much as possible. They believe that the path to the Democrats securing and even potentially expanding that majority in the Senate will run right through the state of Wisconsin. Kristen? Yeah, Democrats see Wisconsin as one of their potential pickup seats. There's no doubt about that. Shaq, sure. really great reporting and interviews with the candidates. So we're, we're of Thank course, you. all going to watch very closely to see what happens in the debate on Sunday. What do you think the big issues are going to be in the debate? You talked about how they want to nationalize this. Ron Johnson making inflation, of course, the big issue, the economy. What are Democrats going to be talking about? That's right. When you talk to the candidates, there is definitely that focus on the economy, but you also hear the focus on winning and keeping control of the Senate. And what they say is that they, in order to pass their agenda, in order to pass, uh, in, or in order, I should say, to codify a row, in order to pass voting rights or to pass substantial climate change legislation, they say they need to win this seat. You know, something unique in this race is there's not much daylight between these candidates. These candidates agree on a lot of the same issues. They have very similar policy positions. So what you 
you expect to see and what you can expect to see on that stage is these candidates try to point out what makes them different and what makes them the best candidate to take on and defeat Ron Johnson. Kristen, it's something similar to what we heard in 2020, where when you talk to the voters, their priority is defeating the Republican incumbent. In 2020, it was President Trump. This time around, it's Senator Ron Johnson here in Wisconsin. It sure is. All right. Well, they're going to be fireworks, I bet, on Sunday. Shaq Brewster, such great reporting as always. Great to see you. Thank you. And as always, you can find more excellent coverage from my colleagues on the campaign trail on the Meet the Press blog. That's NBCNews.com slash Meet the Press blog. It's your essential one-stop shop for all things midterms and politics as we close in on November. It sure is coming fast. Well, still ahead, what a week it's been. The president's meeting with MBS, bad poll numbers, worse inflation, and now a major setback for Democrats' agenda. My panel digs into all of that and more after the break. You're watching Meet the Press now. Oh, I, I'm, I'm not stopping. Uh, you know what? They, uh, this is rhetoric. I've been through this all my life politically, and I've never seen it at this level, high of level, that you would throw caution, just throw it out like, well, we'll throw it out, and then stick the dogs on them, thinking they're going to put all this pressure on me. I am where I have been. Welcome back. That was Senator Joe Manchin defending his refusal to support key climate and tax provisions in the Democrats' reconciliation bill. As we mentioned earlier, it's a blow for President Biden's domestic agenda. And it comes while the president meets with officials in Saudi Arabia as part of a controversial trip that he was quite reluctant to take. Joining me now to discuss all of this and Biden's issues both at home and abroad is our fantastic Friday panel. Kayla Tausche, CNBC senior White House correspondent, Washington Post columnist Eugene Robinson and Republican strategist Rick Tyler. Thanks to all of you so much for being here. Eugene, I want to start with you and get your reaction to what we have seen so far from President Biden's trip in Saudi Arabia. He says he raised the issue of Jamal Khashoggi with the Saudi crown prince. He also seemed to signal there may be some movement when it comes to energy, when it comes to convincing Saudi Arabia to increase oil production. What are your big takeaways? Were the rewards worth the risks? Well, we'll see. I mean, we'll see what the deliverables are uh, on this uh, from this trip. I, mean, I actually thought the Israel part of the trip was was quite interesting. It was good that he went to the Palis visit the Palestinian Authority, reaffirmed the United States commitment to a two-state solution, um, uh, one for the Israelis, one for the Palestinians. That seems a long way away now, but I think it was it was important uh, to get back engaged in that question because it's it's in stasis. It's not getting any better, uh, and things in the Middle Middle East that don't get better get worse. Um, with MBS, you know. Kind of who cares if it was a fist bump or a handshake? Um, it's good that he raised the fact that that MBS was, you know, was responsible for having a colleague of mine uh, kidnapped and killed and dismembered with a bone saw. Um, so it's good that he raised that. Uh, but it's real politic. Let's see what the deliverables are. Let's see if we get some movement on energy. Let's see if we get some Saudi intervention uh, in, a, in a constructive way uh, in the, all the gnarly problems that the Middle East still has. Rick Tyler, way in here. On the one hand, you have that fist bump. As Eugene says, he did raise uh, the issue of Jamal Khashoggi's death and killing. Uh, he seemed to be quite firm. Was he firm enough uh, and do you think that the fact that he seems to maybe have made some progress on energy, uh, will that ultimately be something that's felt by American consumers? Uh, well, look, the outcome of, of, of the uh, economic impact on the gas prices uh, is more complicated than, than just opening up the spigots in Saudi Arabia, which they certainly could do. I would personally rather see Joe Biden meet with the U.S. oil companies and open up the spigot in, in U.S. production rather than asking the Saudis to do the same. Uh, and then he wouldn't have had to gone over and look like he's capitulating and, uh, and giving concessions uh, at every at every moment. I, I think it was a terrible spectacle for the president of the United States to, to meet with him. Look, Saudi Arabia is, is a fact more than it is a problem. You have to deal with Saudi Arabia, but I don't think it should have been done on the presidential level. On, on the Israel trip, Israeli trip, 
uh, I think he said some positive things. He reaffirmed uh, the, the relationship with the United States in, and Israel. He, he did the same uh, with the Palestinian territories. I disagree with the fact that, that there is a two-state solution. I don't know what the geographic possibility of a two-state solution uh, is anymore. Uh, that went out in about the 1980s. I think it left with Yasser Arafat. Kayla, let's talk about the issue of gas prices, because my colleague Peter Alexander asked the president, when could American consumers potentially feel the impact of the discussions that he's having right now in Saudi Arabia? The president said it could be a matter of weeks. That really stood out to me. Is that realistic? What are you hearing? It is, Kristen. There is a date that's circled on everyone's calendars, and that's August 3rd. That's the next time that the uh, oil-producing nations known as OPEC Plus are going to be gathering. And that's usually the forum where we see these countries agree to any sort of coordinated increase in oil production. That's why you saw the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, try to temper expectations for this trip and saying there's not going to be any immediate bilateral deliverable that comes out of the Saudi leg of this trip. And that's why you saw the president say, uh, you know, essentially, it's going to be a few weeks before this pans out. We saw the OPEC countries a couple months ago agree to a very small production increase, but it wasn't really enough to move the needle. We've heard President Macron suggest that maybe these Gulf nations don't really have that much extra oil that they can pump, but some analysts on Wall Street say they do. They have several million additional barrels per day that they could put on the market. But there's one other wild card here, Kristen, and I think it's interesting that there was so much focus on the Iran deal and the approach to Iran uh, during the first part of this trip in Israel. And that's because Iran has been prohibited from selling its oil freely into the market because of sanctions for its nuclear program. If there is some sort of progress on that deal, then perhaps that's a spigot that could start flowing too, and uh, a controversial one, but that could also move the needle on gas prices. I'm glad you raised that. I think it's an important part of the equation and one of the big unknowns that we are watching. When you think about inflation, when you think about high gas prices, you have to talk about the negotiations that were going on on Capitol Hill that now seem to be over yet again. Senator Manchin saying he's not going to support this broader climate and tax deal that he'd been working on with Senator Schumer. Eugene, what is the impact of that? I mean, this feels like, uh, you know, deja vu all over again. Senator Manchin pulled out of the deal several months ago. Is this time, is the deal now dead, in other words? Well, how could it be deader than it was before? I mean, it was like, what did people <laughs> expect? Um, and at some point, you know that Lucy's going to pull the football away. At some point, you know right. that Joe Manchin is not going to support climate initiatives. He's not going to support uh, uh, raising, uh, you know, making the tax system more fair, uh, you know, which is what I would call it. But he's not going to support that. And he, he's been very clear on that. So I don't know why anybody expected this to have a different result. I mean, he maybe he wanted to be the star of the Joe Manchin show uh, again for another few weeks. Um, uh, maybe he was feeling lonely. But in the end, he wasn't going to move. And I, it just boggles my mind that anybody is surprised on this outcome. He's been very clear about what he's going to give and what, what can be done, negotiating on on uh, drug prices, bring those prices down, and, and, and a few other things uh, that he's in support of. But as long as the Senate is 50-50 and every single Democratic vote is needed, then, you know, you are stuck with what Joe Manchin is willing to do. And that's actually been pretty consistent. Rick Tyler, uh, Republicans are licking their chops, undoubtedly, as they see yet another Biden agenda item fall flat. And yet there's a big unknown for Republicans when former President Trump, he says he's going to get into the game, when he might announce his reelection. Give us a reality check here. How nervous are Republicans that the president is going to announce before the midterms and then the race will be all about him? Well, two things. On Democrats, I don't understand why Democrats think they have a mandate when they only have when they have a 50-50 set in, in a house. You don't have these big, huge agenda items and blame it all on Joe Manchin. On the on, on Trump announcing potentially this fall, I think is a disaster for Republicans because he will consume as he did in 2016 and during his entire presidency. Of course, presidents do, but he has a unique ability uh, to garner media. And the fact is, is, is he will drive. The media agenda and every president, every candidate uh, up and down the ticket, and every candidate, every congressional candidate, and every Senate 
candidate that's trying to help them win the majority for the Republicans is going to be asked, uh, you know, what, did, what is your reaction to what Donald Trump said this morning? Uh, and they're never going to be able to get their message out. I just think it's, a, I just think it's going to be, it'll be a disaster. All right. Well, we will leave it with that final word. This is a great conversation, guys. Thank you so much. Kayla, Eugene. <laughs> Kayla, Eugene, and Rick, thank you. Really appreciate it. And thank you for being with us this hour. I will be back on Monday with more Meet the Press Now. NBC News Now coverage continues with my colleague Lindsay Riser in for Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.